be here. Uh, especially good to be here since I uh, called my wife on uh, Monday. I was down in the New Braunfels area and uh, it was 86 degrees at the time. I called up home. She told me it was snowing. <laughs> So I was very grateful to be where I was. Uh, the winters do start a little early. Usually by Halloween we get our first snowfall. Uh, it doesn't stick around until late November, early December. But uh, still, it's good to be where it's 86 degrees instead of where it's 26 degrees. Um, it, it's good to see the so many young people here tonight. Uh, you know, I, I've been out for not quite two years now visiting churches to talk about Maine and the burden that God has, has put on my heart. Uh, and, you know, a number of the churches that I've been to, quite a number of them, I've been the youngest person there. And it, it, that tells me that in a couple years that church probably won't be there, maybe 10 or 15 years. Uh, but looking out here and seeing the uh, age groups that are rep represented here, it tells me this is a church that's, that's doing its job. It's reaching people and not just trying to maintain a status quo, but getting out there and reaching people and uh, uh, bringing people to Christ. And that's, that's what it's all about. Uh, not, not just the uh, older crowd, but um, the younger ones. Sometimes the younger ones can be more difficult to deal with. But uh, Jesus brought them to him anyway. Um, I pastored for uh, 13 years up in the western mountains of Maine. It's the, uh, it's the northern end of the Appalachians is what it is. Right up there against the French-speaking part of uh, Canada, the province of Quebec. Um, the, the county there is, is Franklin County, Maine. Um, a good, uh, you know, just morally strong people. Um, if, if you look at the uh, voting records, you'll see that uh, that whole part of Maine, western Maine, northern Maine, the, the southeastern part of Maine are all solidly red year after year after year after year. Uh, but the problem is, is, as your pastor mentioned, it's a very economically depressed area right now because the, the backbone of the, uh, the economy in our area has always been the wood mills. Uh, the town I pastored in used to be the, the rolling pin capital of the world. I don't know if they actually have a trophy for that somewhere or what, but uh, another couple towns over was the toothpick capital of the world, and there was a clothespin capital of the world. I mean, it, back when they all made all that stuff out of wood, but uh, you go looking at rolling pins now, and most of them, you, you have a hard time finding one made out of wood now. Almost everything that used to be made out of wood in our part of the state of Maine has been offshored to uh, Asia now. Uh, and that's created a lot of uh, hopelessness. Problem is, the people that are there don't have churches to turn to to find hope. We have a lot of problems in our country today, but there's not a political solution. There's not an economic solution or a social solution. There's one solution, and it's one soul at a time. And when you don't have a good, solid, Bible-believing church that's proclaiming the Word of God, not just parts of it, but the whole counsel of God, not just the parts that people find comfortable, and that make you go home with a warm and fuzzy feeling, but also the parts that challenge you to grow and to step out and be better, be nearer to Christ. You don't have that. You don't have a source of hope. Maine right now has 400 towns of a thousand people or less in those rural areas that have no church. What you'll find in those areas is uh, oftentimes you'll find uh, uh, the United Methodists in there. But back in the 1980s, in our area, the United Methodists were already putting lesbians in the pulpit. Um, you'll find 
some of the old mainline uh, denominations like the Congregationalists who have his and hers ministry teams now, uh, the Reverend Rebecca and the Reverend Fred, um, proclaiming a social gospel, doing a great work with food pantries and clothing closets and such, but not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is what we really need. It's a good thing, I believe it's a good thing to give someone food when they need it and to give someone clothing when, we need, when they need it. Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew that we ought to do that when somebody is in need. But the greatest need, if, if, if all you do is meet physical needs and you don't take that other step and strive to meet that spiritual need, then you failed in helping them. Maine is, uh, and the whole Northeast is, so it's, it's a little different than the rest of the country. Some of you who have been up there uh, will know what I mean. Uh, Gallup did a poll of the most Christian states in America. Uh, Mississippi was right up there, number one. Uh, they're, they're, year after year, they're right there, number one. You got many of the Bible Belt states following them. Texas is number 12 in the country for most Christian states. Maine is number 48, followed by Massachusetts and Vermont. New Hampshire is 47. Um, all of those New England states are right down there at the bottom of the list. And it's, and it's so ironic because we're talking about the area of the country where it all began. We're talking about where the pilgrims settled. We're talking about the part of the country where the first Baptist to tread North America walked and taught and were beaten and were imprisoned and suffered for Christ and yet kept pushing forward and did a great work. We're talking about the land of uh, D.L. Moody. We're talking about the land of uh, uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God preached right there in, in Connecticut by Jonathan Edwards. We're talking about the land where, where uh, so many of the great revivals started in the early days of this nation and spread across the country, and today it is literally a pagan country. When I go door knocking up there uh, in those rural areas, if I find someone in their 40s or younger, chances are they have never been to church in their life. Not even for a wedding or for a funeral. Church is not a part of the culture there. You don't, you don't walk around up there and meet people very often that grew up in Sunday school. Yet what we have, it's, it's happened so fast. It's happened in a generation. Um, my dad told me of going to meetings at churches in Maine and some of those rural towns when a speaker would come in from out of town and, uh, and he and other young men would have to stand outside the windows and listen because the crowd was so great there wasn't room in the church to hold everybody. Those same churches today are closed down or they have five or six people left. And it's happened just like that because a generation of Christians got comfortable in their churchianity and they were great at attending church, but when it came to soul winning, when it came to telling other people about Christ, when it came to reaching out to those young people, they failed because they were comfortable where they were. And in just one generation of that, we have what we have now in New England. Um, when I began preaching up there, uh, we were the only, in the entire county, we were the only uh, uh, independent King James Fundamental Baptist Church in the county. Uh, today we have, uh, there's, there's a church plant that's about five or six years old. There's another church plant that's uh, about six months old. But even now, if you take all three of those churches and you take those uh, uh, the Sunday morning crowds on a good Sunday, you could just about fit them all right up here on the platform in the seats that you have up here. 
We need laborers. That's what God has burdened us to do. We need to reach out in those towns. There is so much opportunity out there. People are looking, especially in the younger generation. See, the young people, they've seen their parents grow up without Christ, and they say, that didn't work out too well. I don't want to be like that. And they go looking for some other meaning in life, but unfortunately they find it all too often in the wrong places. We have one of the highest rates of teenage drinking in the country. The next county over there's a little town, an old uh, uh, woodmill town, that has the highest rate of teenage drinking in the country. Uh, uh, Farmington, Maine, our uh, county seat, we've got about 5,000 people, two witchcraft stores to service the needs of the pagans that are in the area. New England has always had an undercurrent of paganism and witchcraft. It's not an undercurrent anymore. In the absence of the Holy Spirit, in the absence of God's churches, it's come right to the surface and it's glorified and you see it everywhere and it's right out in public. And they're recruiting. The Jehovah's Witnesses are all through that area. They're, they're like cockroaches through all those mountains and all those villages. They put us to shame. They see the opportunity. They see there's a generation that's looking. And we either, we're either going to be there for that generation. And maybe see God do something that shakes this country to the core. Or we're going to lose our nation. You say, why, why is New England so important? It's because what's going on up there is spreading across the entire country right now. Uh, I've spoken with pastors in, in uh, South Carolina, in Tennessee, in Kentucky, you know, right through that old Bible belt. And I've said, well, you've got a lot of good churches around here. I mean, sometimes in one town they'll have four uh, independent Baptist, King James Bible preaching, soul winning churches. And that's j just an alien concept to people coming out of the Northeast. And one preacher said, well, yes, we do, but... And he started listing out churches that used to be in his lifetime. Churches that ran 2,000 that are running 100. Churches that ran 1,500 that don't even exist anymore. And just church after church after church that has declined by significant amounts or just completely disappeared. It's spreading and it's coming, but we're rising to meet that challenge. Uh, yes, we're living in the last days, I completely believe it. But I don't believe that just because these are the last days, God says, okay church, roll over and play dead till I come. Amen. We have a nation to reach. We have the greatest mission field in the entire world right outside these doors. You don't have to learn another language. You don't have to move. You don't even have to leave your church here to reach that mission field. It's not just in New England. And it's down here, too. Uh, we had a young lady in our youth group. We have uh, an evangelistic youth group. We just bring kids in from all over the area um, on vans into the church on Monday night. And uh, we had one young lady there for the first time, and we were talking that night about why people say there is no God. It's a big, a big thing up there, because it's something that a lot of the young people confront every day. And right in the middle of it, this, this lady, she's 16 years old, she uh, uh, just started bawling, just started crying. We stopped and we asked her what was going on, and she said, her parents had always told her there was no God. And she got to the point where she just didn't see the point. If there's no God, if all we are are just animals that evolved to live here, there is no point, is there? That's what our young people are being taught. Three days before, she had tried to take her own life. And if it weren't for the intervention of her parents who walked in while she was trying to do it and put a stop to it, she would not have been alive to come to that youth group that Monday morning, uh, that Monday evening. 
where she heard the gospel and got saved that night and held in her hands for the first time in her entire life a Bible for the first time ever. But people like Megan are everywhere up there. Everywhere you go, it's, it, it's a cold people. They're not an open and a friendly people. But when you, when you get to know them and, and they get to trust you, they, they ask questions and they want to know and they want to come and, and they come and visit and they listen to you. Uh, you know, I talked to some of the preachers down south. I tell you, I used, I used to think I had the hardest mission field of anyone up there in, in, in rural Maine. But uh, talking, talking to some of the preachers down here, they said, well, down here, everybody's saved said before you can actually get them saved you have to get them unsaved you have to tell them that their baptism didn't save them their church attendance didn't save them their their church membership didn't save them their great grand uncle Fred who was a preacher didn't save them that the only one who can save them is Jesus Christ and they have to go to him personally and then when you get someone saved and get them into church they, they bring uh, baggage from so many different denominations with them. We have an advantage up north, if you want to call it that. So few people have been to church that when you get them saved, you get to get in there and disciple them. You get to lay that foundation. You get to put solid Bible doctrine into them. And they listen and they're hungry for it and they want it. And that's a blessing to be able to, to do that. Um, my wife is not here tonight, as Pastor said. Uh, she has some uh, uh, bad discs in her neck that are starting to fuse together. The 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 discs, or the the the, ver the vertebrae are starting to fuse together. The discs are are worn out, so she can't uh, travel right now. She was with us when we first started out, but she just she just can't go more than an hour or so and. The number of miles that we put on, she just she just can't do that. Uh, my older kids all have jobs now; they're out of school, so that leaves Joseph. He gets to go out with Daddy, and uh, I'm thankful for Joe. I'm thankful for him being here. He turned 16 last week. That was his second birthday on the road, away from home and away from his mama and away from his family. So I'm, I'm grateful that he's kept a good attitude through all of this, and uh, I don't know what I'd do without him. He's 16 going on 17 now. <laughs> he used to tell people, I'm 15, almost 16. Now it's 16 going on 17, even though 17 is a year away. Um, I'm happy to talk... Uh, as much as you like. If you have questions about Maine and the mission field up there, um, what God has burdened us to do is to get into other rural communities up there and get churches going, um, to get a gospel lighthouse. If God tarries and if God allows us in, in every uh, little rural community up there, um, you say, well, that's, that's impossible. That's too many communities. It probably is impossible for me, but, you know, if I go, maybe someone else will go. Maybe someone else will go. Maybe someone else will go. And if we win some people and train them to win some people, then maybe they'll be called and they'll go out and reach some people. We have an opportunity if, if we just, if we have laborers and if we reach souls up there that... We could see a new Bible Belt in this country across upstate New York and through New Hampshire and uh, uh, rural Maine. That opportunity exists without exaggeration. Uh, but it's going to take laborers and it's going to take elbow grease. It's going to take some work. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about that if you have questions about the work up there um, after the service tonight. Um, but real quick, I want to share just... Something that I think is really important for us at this time in the history of our nation. If you'd turn with me to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. I want to read here just these first two verses. 
Isaiah 60, starting in verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall, ar shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. I think the most important lesson from these two verses, and it's not the thrust of the message tonight, but uh, the most important lesson that we, we can get from these two verses is that uh, it's not about us. God tells us to be salt and light, but you know the light we give isn't our light. If I run around rural Maine giving out my light, and just trying to show people how good of a guy I am and how nice I am and how much I care about them and love them, I will have failed utterly to help them in any way. We need to be lights like the moon is a light. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, it tells us how God created two lights, one to rule the day and one to rule the night, and yet the moon, that light in the night, has no light of its own. All the light that it sheds on the world is purely a reflection of the sun. And as we go out in the world, and as, as we're with family members, and we're out in the workplace, and, and, and we're out in the stores, and whatever we're doing, uh, the light that we shed should be a reflection of God. It's His glory, it says here. It says, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and His glory shall be seen upon thee. The more of His light that we shed, the more of an impact we will have. He's not looking for people who are charismatic. He's not looking for people who are great and eloquent speakers. He's not looking for people who are handsome. He's not looking for people who are talented, who have great abilities. If he were on any of those accounts, I wouldn't be standing here tonight, honestly. He's looking for people who are willing to shine for him. Amen. Who are willing to say, it's God. It's not me. It's not my ability. It's not my talent. It's nothing to do with me. It's, it's all about God. And when we're willing to do that, he provides the abilities. He provides the open doors. He provides the resources. We just need to be willing to shine for him, to reflect his light in a dark world says, for behold, verse 2, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross or heavy darkness the people. What a description of the times that we live in today. In fact, if you read Isaiah and Jeremiah and you look at the descriptions of the kingdom of Judah, what, what had happened in the northern and the southern kingdoms back in that time, what the people were like and what they were doing, it's, it's, it actually, sometimes it, it'll make your skin crawl because you'll, you'll be there reading and you'll say, that's America. You know, I, I saw that yesterday. That's what people are like today. That's what churches are like today, the, the bulk of them, as you read through. You see, there's a darkness that's covered our land, a heavy darkness, the hearts of the people. And I don't have to dwell too much on that. I don't have to explain that. We've seen what's happened with the Supreme Court. We see what's coming out of Washington, D.C., the, the, the constant uh, uh, sewerage that's just pumped out of uh, the television sets from Hollywood. We see where our nation is, and we see how dark it is. You see, we don't live at the sunrise of the church age anymore. Can you imagine living back in the time of the Apostle Paul and John and Peter, being able to sit at their feet and listen to them preach, listen to them teach? Wouldn't that be awesome? Within a generation, they, they, they turned the Roman Empire upside down. Just, just a handful of people sold out for God. Exciting times. And yet, these same people looked forward to the times that we live in today. See, God has placed us at a very special time in history today. And he didn't put us here by mistake. 
He didn't put us at that, that sunrise, that uh, moment in, in the church age. He didn't put us in the glory days of the foreign missionary movement. That was uh, we, we generally look at William Carey as starting that and the thousands of missionaries that were sent out to the foreign field and the hundreds of thousands of people that were saved through that. We don't live in the glory days of the American church anymore either, as I'm sure you've noticed. And sometimes uh, we think, wow, it wouldn't have been great if we'd lived back then. It wouldn't have been great to sit in a tabernacle and listen to Billy Sunday preach. Or listen to D.L. Moody preach. Wouldn't it have been great to shake hands with George Mueller or Hudson Taylor? Wouldn't that have been fantastic? And yet, all of these men throughout history looked forward to the days that we are in. See, God has put us here in this day, as Mordecai said to Queen Esther, for such a time as this. He's put us here. God didn't make a mistake when he didn't put us back in the glory days. He put us here for a particular reason. Every single person who is in here tonight has been chosen for this time in history for a special task. We don't live at the sunrise of the church age. We don't live at the noonday of the church age. We live in the sunset hours. We live in the dark hours when darkness is overwhelming the nation. We are, in the military terms, we are God's night watch. See, there's nothing else that needs to happen before Jesus returns. Amen. Nothing else on that prophetic calendar that God has. It could be tonight, it could be tomorrow. We don't know when it's going to be, but there's nothing else that has to be fulfilled until that happens. Until then, we live in a dark world. We're keeping God's night watch. And when, when an army encamped for the night, they selected dependable people to stand watch for the night. And there are four things about that I just want to really quickly go down through tonight before we go home. But he chose us for this. Something about us. He chose us and he put us here and expects us to do this. That we live in a dark world. We're standing the, the night watch for God. The, the number one thing I want to tell you tonight is that the, the, the time of the night watch is a time of great peril. For armies, uh, even right up through modern day, the most dangerous time is during the night. Because it's during the night when the enemy tends to attack. It's during the night when the enemy tries to get the upper hand. And at nighttime, spiritually speaking, in this country, we see that the enemy is emboldened. He's become brave. He, is, he has taken territory that, that even in my short life, when I was a child, I never ever would have expected him to take from us. He has conquered organizations. He has taken fortresses. He has taken hilltops that I never expected him to take. I'm 48 years old. And that's not very old. But even when I was a teenager, if someone had tried to tell me what the Supreme Court of the United States just did a few weeks ago, I would have laughed at them and told them they were crazy. But it's accelerating now. The darker it gets, the braver the enemy gets, the more bold he gets. And you see his colors flying and his armies marching and they're coming at us. They want to knock this church flat. They want to knock every Bible-believing church right off the map. They want to go after the pastors and the pastors' families. They want to go after the families that come out and support the Sunday school. They want to knock out the families that come out and support the soul winning on Saturdays. They want to knock you out of the game. And they're doing a very, very good job at it. This is a time of greatest peril. That night watch for a physical army, it's a time of great peril. But for us in the Lord's army, as, as we stand in these nighttime hours, these dark times at the end of time, it's perilous. Because the enemy is full of himself. And the enemy is acting like he thinks he can actually win. But just in case... 
just in case we start to despair. I was looking at the end of the book the other day. It says we win. In fact, if you look through this book, what's happening now in the world, what's going on, God said it would. It's just, it's part of his plan. It's part of the schedule that he's laid out. Everything that's happening is just lined up perfectly, word for word, sentence for sentence with what's going on, what's going on in the world, lining up perfectly with, with, with what God said was going to happen in these end days. The time of the night watch is a time of great peril, but it's also it's a, it's a time that's hard to endure. It's not easy to stand watch during the dark hours, during the night. My son-in-law, uh, about a year and a half ago, completed uh, boot camp at Paris Island, became a, a U.S. Marine, and he loved the physical part of it. He loved to be challenged physically. He's, he's one of these guys that he, he, he has this vest and he likes to put lead weights in it and go running. Crazy stuff. You'll see a wooden beam and he'll just start pulling himself up and down on it, you know. He's just ultra-physical, and he loves it, and he loves to be pushed right to the edge of his capability. And he eats it up, and he loved that part of boot camp. But there was something he discovered that he did not like. And that was when the drill instructor came and said, Richardson, you've got watch tonight. In fact, in the Marine Corps, they call it fire watch. That's another sermon completely, because part of their job in the old days was to keep the fire burning during the dark hours. Uh, another message for another day, but he found that it was hard to endure because you had to stay up and alert when all your buddies started shutting down. When all the activity started to calm down and settle down, when people started going to sleep, you had to keep going. You had to keep doing your duties and fulfilling your responsibilities. And when your buddy there, when he put his earbuds in and chose a little bit of entertainment over duty, he still had to do his duty. When his buddy over there fell asleep, he still had to do his duty. Look, we're in the Lord's army today and we're standing night watch for, for God. And it is a time that is hard to endure. Because we look around us and we see people falling asleep in a spiritual sense that we never would have expected before. We see people that, that you know, 10 years ago we say, wow, those guys are powerhouses for God. They're just going to keep going and keep going. They're going to do great things for God. And yet... You have to watch them go to sleep. We live in a day when, when people choose an entertainment-oriented religion yeah. where they can go on Sunday and feel comfortable and come out with a warm and fuzzy feeling instead of going to where the whole counsel of God is preached, where they're challenged to be better, where they're provoked to be more than they are, where they're edified, where they're challenged to be better Christians. It's a time that's hard to endure because we have to watch a whole society. We have to watch friends. We have to watch family members make those choices and sit down when they should be standing night watch with us. See, we live in a day when a lot of the activity in churches has died down. There aren't so many Bible-believing churches as there used to be. The time of the night watch is a time of great peril. It's a time that's hard to endure, but number three, it's a time when people depend upon us. Uh, you look in Ezekiel chapter 33 where God talks about the watchman, and he tells Ezekiel that he is his watchman, and he says that when he puts a watchman on the wall, if trouble comes and that watchman warns people and the people ignore it, well, that's on the people's head. But he said, if trouble comes, the watchman sees it and he doesn't warn the people. That's on the watchman's head. We see the trouble coming. It's, it's right in our face. And God wants us to reach people. 
He wants us to bring more people through the doors of this church. He wants us to bring more people in for Sunday school. He wants us to bring more people in on Wednesday night. He wants us to go out on the Saturday mornings for visitation and knock as many doors as we can and hand out as many tracts and flyers as we can because he's depending upon us like never before. You see, we don't live in a day now where we can afford to say, well, I'm not going to reach so-and-so because cousin so-and-so will reach them instead. Now today they'll just go to hell if we don't open our mouth. Gone are the days when we can say, oh, the church across town, they'll reach that neighborhood. Because today the church across town is having a hard time reaching their own neighborhood. We don't live in those glory days of the church anymore. We don't live in the days when there's so much activity. We don't live when there are so many people doing the job, preaching the gospel. Today we live in those dark times and that's, and, and that's why people now depend upon us. If we don't tell them, who is going to? Say, so, well, I can't, I can't talk to them about Christ. I just, I just don't have that gift of evangelism. It's, it's not a gift that he gives. You read there in, in, in uh, there at the end of Matthew, and, and it's a command. But the, the way God works is he doesn't give you everything you need and then let you decide if you're going to step out or not. He lets you step out first when he sees that faith then he's there and he gives you everything you need and you'd be surprised when you go knock on that door and that door opens you'd be surprised how the Holy Spirit is there giving you just the words you need for the person behind that door when you go to aunt so and so or cousin so and so or your brother or your parents you'd be amazed as you open your mouth for God how he puts words in there that they need at just that moment God doesn't want to see people go to hell. He wants to see people in heaven. Amen. And He wants to use us to get people there. The night watch is a time of great peril. It's a time that's hard to endure. It's a time when souls are depending upon us. But finally, number four, it's also a time when the captain comes for a visit. Usually at just the right time. Uh, I had a friend who passed away about four or five years ago, 99 years old. He used to pick him up on Sunday mornings, take him to church, and he would tell stories about just everything in his life. And um, a lot of them were centered around World War II. He's in the army during World War II, and he was stationed in Hungary. And one night, when he had the night watch, there was this figure coming through the dark at him. And he shouted the challenge, and the figure didn't respond. And he shouted, shouted the challenge again, and there was no response. And finally, he shouted the challenge a third time, and he put the rifle on his shoulder, and he chambered around, and put his finger on the trigger, just as the general in charge of all the forces in that region emerged from the darkness and Stephen thought his goose was cooked. He had just pointed a loaded gun at the general and he had his finger on the trigger. And the general put his arms on Stephen's shoulders and he said, don't worry about it. That's why I'm out here tonight. He says, I'm out here to see if my people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And when they are, he says, I just want to encourage them to hang in there until dawn until the watch is over. We live in a special time. We live in a time that none of our forefathers in this nation have really experienced as we have. But we still have that advantage that King David had. You read so many of those Psalms and he starts out talking like the world is ending. And some, somewhere in the middle of that Psalm, God shows up and it turns from an oh me, oh my uh, Psalm into just glorifying God and shouting his praises. And that same God is here for us just when the times get dark. Just when we think that we can't go on any further. Just when we're saying, God, I don't have the strength to do this. God, I can't 
can't do this anymore. God, I can't keep teaching this Sunday school class. God, I just I can't keep doing this. And he shows up and he puts his arms around us and he encourages us. Those who have, who have experienced that, just you know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen. Just the right time. He knows when to show up to comfort us and to encourage us and to get us to go just, just a little bit further. Just a little bit further. The night watch is a time of great peril. It's a time that's hard to endure. It's a time when people depend upon us. It's a time when the captain comes for his special visits just in the right time. But every soldier throughout the history of the world knows that his night watch is over when he looks up into the eastern sky and he sees the sun. And there's coming a time for us when we're going to look into that eastern sky and we're going to see the sun, the Son of God, coming through the clouds to take us away, to pull us out of here. And then we'll know that our watch is over. Then we can enter into the tents of rest. Then we can fellowship with our Lord. Then we can fellowship with those who have gone on before us. Then we'll have a great big feast, the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's going to be a wonderful day. I'm looking forward to that day. We live in exciting times. It's easy when we get our eyes off of the words of God here in the Bible and what he says is going to be happening. It's easy to get discouraged and dismayed. But when we realize that, hey, we are the night watch. We are put here by God for a special purpose at this special time. We're living in the time that Daniel looked forward to throughout history. We're living in a time that Jeremiah looked forward to throughout the years of history that John, the Apostle Paul, looked forward to. Oh, they, they would have loved to live at this time. But here we are, put here by God, with a job to do. I want to leave you with three challenges, and I'll sit down and shut up. Number one, he's coming soon. Amen. That's going to be a glorious day. That's going to be an exciting day. It's going to be a joyful and a happy day for those of us who are saved. But if you're not saved here tonight, that day isn't going to be a joyful day for you because that day is going to usher in the most destructive, horrible time in human history. And you're going to be left here to go through that. God says today is the day of salvation. If he's tugging at your heart, respond tonight. Don't put him off. Every time you say no to God, every time you push him aside, every time you feel that tug and you say no, it gets so much easier to do it the next time and the next time and the next time. If he's tugging at your heart, respond tonight. Don't put it off. There might not be a tomorrow. But even if there is a tomorrow, it's going to be a much more joyful tomorrow if you give yourself to God tonight. Number one, if you're not saved, take care of that tonight. Number two, we live in special times. God is calling people to do special things. He's not looking for any... Uh, talent, money, special resources, eloquence, education levels. He's looking for willing hearts to serve Him. If God has touched your heart to do something, tonight's the night to say, okay God, I'm yours. Amen. Maybe, he's, maybe, maybe, maybe He's called one of the men in here to preach. Maybe He's called someone in here to help out in the Sunday school. Maybe he's touched someone's heart in here to go out Saturday morning for the first time and help on visitation. Whatever it is, whatever he's speaking to you about, whatever ministry that he is drawing you towards, tonight's the night to say, I'm not going to make up excuses anymore. I'm not going to say no anymore. Tonight, I'm going to say yes. 
Let this be the night that you look back to and say that was when everything changed in my ministry, in my life. Number three, are you discouraged? Are you dismayed? We live in dark times. Life has a way of just stomping you down, kicking you around like a football. But we have a God that loves you. Amen. And our God, I feel sorry for these people who, whose God is, is, is this guy with a big baseball bat who just can't wait for them to step out of line so he can pound them. Our God, you look in Romans chapter 10, right at the end of the chapter, and here's the picture it gives of our God, arms outstretched unto a rebellious and again saying stiff-necked people. He wants to receive us. He wants to love on us. He wants to encourage us. He wants to build us up and make us stronger. He wants to help us if we'll let him. Let tonight be the night that you say, okay, God, I'm not going to shoulder this all by myself. I'm not going to look at circumstances anymore, God. I want to be yours. I'm going to give it all to you. Give me your joy. Help me not to be discouraged and dismayed anymore. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Lord, I pray that your word tonight has gone out and touched some hearts. I know, Lord, that you want to do a great work all over this land and all over this world. Start here tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. Pastor.